One. Listen. Hey YouTubers, this is going to be my episode 4 video. We can finally talk about it freely. Just careful for spoilers if you haven't seen it yet. We're officially halfway through the season, so if you are finding me for the first time, be sure to subscribe to get everything. There's a new round of the HBO Now giveaway too. I'll still be doing that for the rest of the year. But there were so many big reveals in this episode, even though it was the shortest of the season. So let's do top 10 WTF and book references. Starting with number 10, we finally get a solid bronze scene. I'm so happy Jerome Flynn is back. He's one of the best actors on the show. So just like Diana Rigg, Queen of Thorns, they expanded that part just because he's so fantastic. But you can kind of tell how he's a little bit of Jamie's conscience, but he's also reminding you that he knows exactly who he is. He's kind of a hound type character where yeah, he recognizes that he does a lot of bad things, but he's coming to the point where he's starting to question the morality of it all. Like when Jamie asks him to go use his talents to get the grain from all the farmers of the reach. And they thread in this really cool idea of the more you have, the more troubles you have, the more it weighs you down. Making you wonder if maybe Jamie will not be quite so weighed down by the end of the season. How much longer is it going to be before he takes that Cersei chain from around his neck and throws it on the ground? And by the end of the episode, Bronn sort of sees his gold sack lying there, leaves it, so it implies that he's going to be much more free for the rest of the season too. Less burdened by some of the more terrible things that they've been doing the last couple of episodes. Another well-timed Rickon joke, triggering everybody again. Rickon? No, Dickon. So Jamie is like slowly showing his true colors. Like he'll come around eventually, he just hasn't quite got to that point yet. But number nine, the Iron Bank is so happy that they're getting their money back, but terrified at the idea that they'll lose the business of the crown. This is one of those really funny, sinister moments where Cersei's like, yes, I'm getting everything that I want. My plan is clear. And Tycho Nestoris is sort of like peeping up over the desk saying, hey, is there anything else that we can help you with? Maybe there's another giant loan that you need. I don't remember what the exact debt of the crown is, but it was several million crowns, I believe. Like, it's just meant to be this astronomical figure that you could barely fathom. Literally everything they have used to repay this debt overnight. So they're just like, this is amazing, but please let us give you another loan so we can start collecting on that one too. We love making money off of you guys. As great as that is, the really big thing here, though, is the name drop of the Golden Company. So if you're not a book reader, the Golden Company was actually formed by Blackfires after the Blackfire Rebellion. Damon Blackfire, the last known possessor of the Blade Blackfire that belonged to Aegon Targaryen, which rightfully belongs to Daenerys now, was driven into exile after the first Blackfire Rebellion. He passed that along to his descendants. The sword ended up being lost, but the Golden Company became this amazing mercenary company that would just relentlessly pursue their target. They have a golden reputation for delivering on their contracts. So the Iron Bank says, oh yes, we use them to collect on delinquent loans. Cersei implies that they're going to be hiring them to bolster their forces, and now it sounds like they definitely need them because of all the troops that Daenerys killed. No idea if they'll include John Connington or if they'll include any Aegon references. They might wink at that, but because they've been rushing the story forward so quickly, I think they're mostly focusing on the Jon Snow Targaryen reveal, so I don't think we're going to see any surprise alternate Targaryens popping up. But number eight, chaos is a ladder. Bran knows everything. So we've talked about this in previous videos. What are Bran's powers? What does he know? Does he secretly peep on everybody in Westeros? So the way that Bran explains it is that he knows everything that's happened. But the problem is, is that he can't focus on it. And he's so inhuman now that it's really hard to communicate with him effectively. But within that same breath, Littlefinger gives him the cat's paws of Valyrian dagger that was used to try and kill him during season one. And it seems like he's just trying to butter him up. Like he thinks that he's going to become the new Lord of Winterfell. So I better get in good with him. I better start working my claws into him the way I'm working them into Sansa. But if they haven't been clear before, this episode definitely wanted to let you know that the Stark children are starting to become a wolf pack and Littlefinger is the lone wolf now. So lone wolf dies, pack survives. The important thing to remember, though, is that even though Bran knows everything that Littlefinger's done, his role in Ned Stark's death, before anybody could revenge kill Littlefinger, they would have to prove his treachery to the other Lords of the Vale, so they would continue to back Sansa in House Stark, even without Littlefinger around. His role in Jon Arryn's death would be a really solid way to do that. 
Jan Royce there would probably strangle Littlefinger himself if he found out that Littlefinger had a big role in killing John Aaron. So depending on what happens, we can revisit that stuff, but it's all callbacks to season one this season. They reference a lot of Arya stuff from season one in the episode. So when it comes to Littlefinger's downfall, it'll probably have something to do with what he did preceding or during season one. But love that Bran Mira scene. He is such a dick. You died in that cave. They just want to make him seem like he's gone full-blown Dr. Manhattan. He's lost his humanity. So Mira is out of there. We're probably not going to hear from her for the rest of the season. We might not even see her during season eight. Maybe when she gets home, she could tell Hal and Reed to come show up and tell everybody about Jon Snow. But number seven, Arya returns to Winterfell. So this is a very touching moment. If you didn't recognize that song cue that they used as she was looking on the horizon there, that's called Winter Has Come. That's literally the name of the song. Anytime there's a big Stark scene, you hear it in the background. So it's kind of a Stark theme. Winter is coming is their motto. So winter, like Arya, has come home just like winter has come. But all the funny moments with the guards, as well as my number six, the fight with Brienne, are just intended to show you what her ninja skills are like. What she might look like when she's going after somebody. So they just want to make her seem like this really badass character. But I felt like the fight was actually pretty good. One of the best Arya fights we've ever seen. There was a lot of the Bravo stuff that just didn't quite work for me as much. But if you really want to get down to it, like if you really want to analyze their fight, she would have zero chances against Brienne. The realest moment of this fight was when Brienne kicked her across the courtyard like a sack of potatoes. She would crush Arya no matter how fast she was. But you have to imagine that there's a certain magical component to Arya's abilities. So that could explain why someone her size could take on someone Brienne's size. And there were so many references to Sirio Pharrell in her technique here. Most of her training came from the House of Black and White. So when Brienne asks her, who taught you how to fight like that? And she says, no one. It's a bit of a wink at the House of Black and White. But she's holding her blade like Sirio Pharrell and the Bravosi water dancers. So they just want to let you know that she still remembers all the things that Sirio taught her as well as what she learned in the House of Black and White. So obviously the other side of this too is the callback to Littlefinger watching this all play out and just taking it all in. So a fun part of this episode was just seeing how Littlefinger reacted to all of the supernatural Stark children like, oh, oh, you know everything that I've done. Okay, I'm going to crap my pants now. I'll be back later. And then as surprised as he is by Arya's actual abilities, he also notices that she has the dagger that he just gave to Bran, making it pretty clear to him how Bran feels about the situation. Like, I don't care about this dagger, I don't care about you, and I know everything that you've done. So Littlefinger is just being backed into a corner slowly. But number five, Stark reunion. So there were a couple reunions. You have Arya and Sansa in the crypts, then you have their reunion with Bran. So these could have been the worst moments of the episode. And I feel like this Winterfell plot relies on their chemistry together. So if their scenes didn't work, you'd be forced to sit through a couple more hours of them together for the rest of the season. So it could have been really bad if it didn't work out. But I think that Maisie and Sophie Turner did a pretty good job with their scenes. They do a good job through their performances of letting you know what their relationship has been. They've never gotten along. They've never seen eye to eye. They've always been so different. But now that they've been through so much, the idea is, is that they come together, they form this wolf pack. So I wouldn't be surprised if Littlefinger tries to use that to his advantage in the next couple of episodes. We'll see if they actually end up doing that. But let me know in the comments how you think that Littlefinger is going to try and play his hand now. That all the Stark children seem like they're coming together, but Arya and Sansa still aren't super crazy about each other. Remember, chaos is a ladder, so he's going to find some way to create more chaos within the Stark family. But number four, back to Dragonstone. Jon and Daenerys in the cave. This was actually a really great scene. They want to show you some of the chemistry they have together. And I do think that from their scenes so far, they've shown that they have chemistry on screen together. But right up until the left turn that she makes, it's just meant to show that they're slowly coming around on each other. Jon Snow is being as genuine as possible. I need your help. I don't think that I can do this without you. In that really important line from Daenerys where she says, I will fight for you, Jon Snow. So a preview of things to come, but not before a bunch of other drama happens between now and then. Like they don't want to make it seem too easy, even though you know what the end point is. Like obviously at some point she's going to say that and mean it without forcing him to bend the knee. But the important thing here is all these cave drawings from the children of the forest. So obviously they're mostly used as an exposition tool. And you see that circular symbol show up that the Night King drew and that you saw when he was being created. So this symbol recurs a lot. It'll probably come back a couple more times as well. 
So right now it just seems like a reference to the cycle of ice and fire. Like this is where it all began and this is where it all comes back to. They offhandedly reference the war with the first men, the pact that they signed on the Isle of Faces, and John says a long, long time ago, but in reality, that was between eight and 10,000 years ago in the book, so you could say thousands of years ago on the TV show. But I did find myself wondering what the children of the forest were doing at Dragonstone if there wasn't a weirwood there, because you don't see them popping up too many places outside of the forest, so maybe at one point there were weirwoods on Dragonstone. But of course, she's off. Number three, we get our reunion with Theon. He washes up on the beach. And Jon Snow, oh, this is so great. So you haven't seen a moment with them together since season one. And he knows everything that Theon has done. He might even still think that Bran is dead. Although I wonder if Sansa told him everything that Theon did because he says, that's the only reason I'm not killing you is because of what you did for Sansa. But when Sansa was rescued by Theon, he told her that he didn't really kill Bran and Rickon. So I'm still betting on the idea that Bran is dead and he thinks that Arya is probably dead too because he hasn't made any reference to her these past seasons. You would think somebody from Winterfell would send a raven to Dragonstone. Oh, by the way, John, your brother and sister that you thought were dead have just turned up. But we got to start talking about the last 15 minutes of the episode. So good. Daenerys attacks Jaime's caravan with the Dothraki and Drogon. So poor Tyrion, he just gets thrown under the bus here. Enough of your clever plans. Your plans are shit. I know it seems like Daenerys is mad at him, but she's just really pissed off about how things have been going. So I don't think there's going to be any really big problems between them within Daenerys' small council. But before the battle, the really important thing here is that she turns to Jon Snow and says, what the hell would you do in this situation? pretty much tells her that you attack King's Landing and burn it to the ground, nobody's going to want to follow you. And because she attacked Jamie's caravan, it means that she listened to his advice. So it's a really effective way of showing you what their status is right now. She's still being really stubborn about him bending the knee, but she is listening to his counsel. She recognizes him as a full-blown ally at this point. So the battle, the first real battle that we've gotten this season, and one of the best ones that the show has done so far, even though it's in one of the shortest episodes, you get to see what the Dothraki are capable of. And if you don't remember it, there's this really amazing line that Robert Baratheon had when he said, only a fool would meet the Dothraki in an open field. So even though you have the added effect of Drogon here burning all these Lannister soldiers, you still would have had this thunderous sea of Dothraki washing over them. I love the way they make them sound like the storm. Daenerys Stormborn, it sounds like a storm is approaching just as the Dothraki crests the hill and the dragon swoops in through the clouds. So there's so much stuff going on here, so much exposition that they get across as the battle starts as well. So just as a reminder, Randall Tarly rides up right before the Dothraki attack and says, the last of the gold has made it through the gates at King's Landing. There were a lot of people that saw the preview after last week's episode and said, well, that gold is not getting to Cersei. She's not going to get her army. But because of Randall Tarly's comment, it means that Cersei did get the gold and she will get those additional troops. So when you see Drogon just burning the hell out of this caravan here, that's all the grain that they collected from the farmers of the Reach. So you see what they did there. They're balancing the playing field. So Daenerys loses a bunch of her army. She takes out a bunch of the Lannister army. If it wasn't clear, the people that she killed were only a small fraction of the Lannister army that you saw at Highgarden. So like all these other people, there's thousands of troops here. This little piece of the caravan that you're seeing is just like a small little bit of that. We watch Drogon almost get winged. He's down, but it hits him in his shoulder. So like Daenerys starts yanking it out. He'll probably be fine. But number one, Probably my favorite moment of the episode, though, is Sir Jaime, the Dragon Slayer. He was the King Slayer, now he's going to try and be the Dragon Slayer, unsuccessfully. So you see him charging Drogon. We have that great line from Tyrion. And what I actually think is going on here is that he was trying to kill Daenerys, not Drogon. And if it wasn't clear, that's Bronn snatching him off the horse at the end. So they're both fine, but they are at the mercy of Daenerys' army now. So we'll see what ends up happening next. Is he going to be their captive? Are they going to try and parlay with King's Landing? Like, we have your Jamie. Maybe we can make a bargain. We'll give him back to you. But let me know in the comments what was your favorite moment from the episode. What will happen next is, is I'll do my trailer video. Then I'll post new Rick and Morty. But if there are any bonus videos that you guys want me to do based on stuff in this episode, just let me know in the comments. Congratulations to the latest giveaway winner, Joyful33. Please private message me on the back end of my channel so I can get your contact details. While you wait for everything to post, you can click here to learn all about Jon Snow and dragons, and you can click here for my episode 3 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.